Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. How much can you change and still have people recognize you as the same person? Former pupil. London had no idea it had lost Hawthorne Circle and did not remember ever having it. It showed up on atlases, gazetteers, and satellite maps, but no one ever looked for it in these records. Utilities ran to it and were paid for, but London police and mail deliveries never had occasion to visit. It was solidly sundered, which meant that the curious luck that hides magic from the world, world at large, was in full operation here. Just as well, reflected Professor Stewart, looking at Charles Darnley, his old student. Thank you for coming out to see me, sir, said Darnley. It seemed much more practical than having you come in, Stuart replied, staring. I hope you don't mind me keeping you outside. Not at all. And indeed, Darnley seemed quite unconcerned as window after window opened around the circle and people leaned out to look at him. This was quite unlike the old Darnley, who had been painfully shy. He was concerned about something, though. I didn't mean to shock you, Professor. I thought I told you I was enlisting in the dedicated cavalry. Stuart waved it away. You probably did. I must simply have spaced the word dedicated. Absent-mindedness is an occupational hazard. He went on staring. Stuart had last seen Darnley a little over a year ago. They had parted with warmth beyond that standard in a successful tutoring job. Stuart had liked the boy, hardworking, bright, polite, and flatteringly interested in Stuart's subject, metaphysical geography. And something in their personalities had clicked. The old Darnley had been a tallish, lumpish young man, pale and dark-haired, a touch under six feet, blocky in build and somewhat overweight. Pudgy would have been unkind, but possibly accurate. The new Darnley was compounded of a large bay horse and a decidedly more athletic version of the old Darnley, wearing a jacket of military cut, red with white piping, and a dark bushy beard. And horseshoes. As Darnley came clopping toward the steps where he sat, the sound reminded Stuart of the milk delivery wagon that served the Grand Norman village where he had grown up. Would you even fit up the stairs to our study anymore? Stuart asked. Darnley laughed. It was an easy laugh, deep and chesty, quite unlike any laughter Stuart remembered from him. Of course, he reflected, he had two chests, now one the size of an oil drum. I might. We take agility classes for just this sort of thing, but it would be needless bother. Any resident of Hawthorne Circle not now watching the conversation would be told by the others they had really missed something. Stuart still felt too flabbergasted to rejoice in the upcoming status, but knew he would later. I came to thank you for the letter of recommendation, Darnley said. It got me in. Stuart wasn't sure of that. Wasn't the dedicated cavalry always short of volunteers? Since, after all, it meant changing as Darnley had changed. But you're entirely welcome, and I'm touched that you came. It was a great deal of trouble to go to, more than Stuart had realized. How did you get here? Darnley jerked a thumb down the street, a brusque gesture not much like the human Darnley, toward a horse trailer parked at the curb. Stuart had been too preoccupied to notice it. Some guys in the expeditionary team had business in London and agreed to haul me down. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. We move out next week and we're not even scheduled to come back for a year, never mind what might actually happen. I wanted to confer one more time thundery chuckle, and maybe to show off. He spread his arms and pranced, pranced, in a tight circle. Was this still really Charles Darnley? Charles, is that you? His daughter Bethy was standing on a step above the one he sat on. Darnley rode over, smiling. No, not rode. He wasn't riding anything. He just walked over. Stuart was on one of the upper steps to be eye level with Darnley, who was now about seven feet tall. Bethy sat down next to her father and smiled back, her gaze roving over Darnley. Paternal alarms went off in Stuart's brain. 
Bethy and Darnley were very much of an age, but after two visits it was clear she regarded him as nothing more than an occasional conversationalist. They joked easily together, but Stuart had detected no hint of attraction on either side. Darnley had been shy at first, cautious afterwards. Bethy had once remarked to Stuart that she found Charles relaxing because he was safe. Stuart had easily decided never to relay that to Darnley. What young man wants to be thought safe? The new Darnley, though, Stuart knew his classical mythology, but weren't cavalry celibate? Darnley didn't look celibate, he looked like a fertility spirit. Maybe he was one now, Stuart would have to research it. His mind had been wandering, occupational hazard. While he had been what his wife called worriting, Charles and Bethy had been catching up on events. Stuart snapped to attention when he heard Bethy ask, can you give me a ride? Darnley, still smiling, mysteriously muttered he was right, then turned side on to the steps and knelt or crouched or whatever you called that posture in a horse. There was an extensive private vocabulary for horses as for ships, Stuart knew. Everybody needs jargon. Stuart felt he disapproved of the impending events, but while he groped for a justification, Bethy skipped down the steps and onto the creature's, onto Darnley's back. This will have to be short, he told her, because we've no saddle and you'll find my spine pretty uncomfortable. See those two heavy white braids on the back of my jacket? Hold on to those, that's what they're meant for. He rose carefully. Bethy squealed as she had not since she was 10. You're meant to be ridden, she asked, sounding incredulous. But then why had she asked for a ride? Sure, this is my dress jacket, but my duty jacket has straps in the same place. You're sliding all over. Hold with your knees, tighter. You can't hurt me that way. We work with the standard cavalry and we sometimes carry them. My usual rider is a guy called Max. He, he trotted or possibly cantered one of those out of earshot. Stuart noticed other voices. Good Lord, every child in the circle and a number of older people had come out into the street. Is that Charles? It was his wife, now standing where Bethy had stood. Yes, I didn't realize it was the dedicated cavalry he'd joined. He's magnificent, Carol opined in a voice that made Stuart resolve to go to the gym more often. He's being magnificent at Bethy, Stuart gr returned gloomily. Let him, Carol answered. He's paid a high enough for it, after all. True enough. To give up your old species, to turn into a fertility spirit, or at least into that shape prancing around the circle, and then be sworn to celibacy. You knew he was going to the dedicated cavalry? It was right there in his email. I managed to miss it. She sat down next to him and squeezed him around the waist in a way that communicated a complete lack of surprise. You must have been quite startled then. I was. Poor devil, it's irreversible. Why would he do it? Why do any of them? She answered in the abstracted voice of one trying to remember, something about being down to your last penny, and then, I found that market where a penny buys a pound. I ask you, sir, was the bargain good or bad? The price was cheap. The price was all I had. Meaning what? Meaning it looks like a terrible price to us, but not to him. It's uncanny, said the man who lived on an enchanted street. I worry whether it's even really Charles out there. Why, because he's happy and confident now? Stuart remembered the dancing piece of mythology, human arms spread in pride, equine body gleaming. It would be a sad thing if being unhappy and unsure were essential to Charles' nature. You're very wise, he told her, returning the hug around the waist. Occupational hazard, she answered. She was a philosophy professor. Charles' nature, though, he went on. What has he done to his nature? About doubled it, it looks like, not reckoning by weight. Darnley concluded the circuit back to their steps. He knelt and Bethy slid off. Thank you. I certainly see what saddles are for now, but that was a treat. He had acquired in his orbit about a dozen children who stared up at him as he rose and rose. Please, mister, can I have a ride? was repeated in several variations. A very small one stroked his side. The skin shivered and Darnley sidestepped out of reach but smiled at the child. 
There was some reproof in the smile, though, Stuart thought. I'm not a beast, might be the message, not just a beast. You mustn't pet me without asking. Carol rose. Charles, you look splendid, quite the young Chiron. Darnley grinned and blushed, as he had not bl blushed before the gazing circle. Stuart stopped worrying if the new creature was really Charles Darnley. The blushing grin was pure Charles, as Stuart had seen him too seldom. I'll try not to fiddle with suspect arrows. To Stuart, I really do want to confer with you, sir, but got to satisfy the ratepayers first. He knelt again and let three children crawl on his back. He had the first one grab the braid on the jacket and the next two hold the waist of the kid before, then rose and repeated the circuit. Three more such circuits and he was done. Need a rub down, asked Carol, smiling. He grinned back, waved the issue away, and sat. That was interesting, the hind leg seated, the front leg still standing. It left his head still level with theirs on the upper steps. We're leaving for Beca <coughs> excuse me. We're leaving for Brickell, then doing exploration and mapping through the Hathor passages. My mates and I will just be trainees, but we can still make our own observations, make suggestions, keep private logs, things like that. I wanted to know if there was anything I could do for you out there. I mean, clearly my influence on decision making will be microscopic, but I'll still be hands and eyes, and I'll be there. My boy, that's very generous of you. Very. He has to know I didn't get him in. He's not repaying a favor. He's making a pure gift. Well, don't look a gift horse. He thought. After a bit, Carol offered Darnley some tea, so he must have been thinking rather long. Watch the skies, please, he said at length. Survey of landforms is the workhorse, uh, sorry, Darnley just grinned, of the exploration, as it should be, but people pay too little attention to the skies. I remember you, remember you said your star mage friend, Dr. Argyris, complained of not knowing what stars to expect on an expedition. Reports mentioned fascinating stuff, like rotating constellations and brilliantly colored lights, stars, planets, the observers don't know which, and eccentric risings and settings, but it's just mentioned in passing, window dressing, nothing quantitative. The only visuals are as backgrounds to pictures of landforms. So start doing metaphysical astronomy as well as geography? Just the kind of reply Charles would make. The last mist of doubt dissolved. It was Charles, large as life and twice as natural, as the old saying went. Stuart laughed. Yes, be the first. See if you can spot Sagittarius in those constellations. He rose and seized Darnley's hand. It was much firmer than it had been. I'm so proud of you, my boy. Carol came up and hugged him. Bethy spotted a good opportunity and did likewise. Darnley blushed furiously. Come on in, Stuart said impulsively. Let's see if you can fit up the stairs. I want to see you in the study one more time. Suddenly, he wanted to be back in the field again. It wouldn't be possible this year, but why not next? Bethy would be off at school. Could he tempt Carol? A metaphysician was as useful as a surveyor on expeditions like these, and they had done it before Bethy was born. And maybe by the time he and Carol were ready, Darnley would be back with these mates he mentioned. Mates were as new in Darnley's life as the additional legs and tail, ready to guide them all out through the Hathor passages, past the border of the unknown. Over the hills and far away, last day of school. It was the last day of school and very hot, so Madame Lis Mademoiselle Lisette, Li excuse me, it was the last day of school and very hot, so Mademoiselle Lisette Lacasse held the, the lessons outside in the light breeze and shade of the great storm oak. The two largest boys had moved the board outside for her, and she was improving the day with a last round of geography. Most of the children were soon off somewhere for the summer, so it seemed a good choice. After she had sketched the English and French coasts on the board, she added some dots and asked, what is the big one here in England? London, shouted several voices. A wit in the back mewed and was joined by others. Take that, Whittingtons. She sighed. And this dot on the coast? Dover, said fewer voices. And across the sleeve in France? Calais. 
We're going there, piped Jeanette, to see my aunt. Where's our town, asked Hubert. He was only five and barely understood maps. England and France are in La Zone Basale, Lisette explained patiently. Merceris must go on another board for Brickell. But Hubert's attention had wandered. Now she noticed several other children were also looking down the road. It was a plain dirt road and something was kicking up a great deal of dust. Next, she heard the clop of hooves and saw figures on horseback. Interesting. She and the children watched expectantly. A few moments later, she cocked her head in puzzlement, as did some of the children. The hoofbeats, she realized, came in a solid rhythm. And something about the figures... Then came the singing, men's voices singing English. O'er the hills we'll march today, the king has called, so we obey. We'll stand our ground and here we'll stay, over the hills and far away. The voices were not exactly men's, not fay, certainly not merfolk, not deeper than men's voices, but more ringing, more resonant. And now they were nearer, and she saw they were not riding horses at all. Of course, they would have more resonance with two chests each. What are they? Robert asked. One of the older children told him, and Lisette wrote it on the board so all could see how it was spelled. To the shores of endless night, we will march to stand and fight. Mortal fay were brothers all. Remember us if there we fall. There were no wars nearby. They could not be heading into battle soon, but of course they were soldiers, cavalry. That's what they sang about. The song ended a few score yards away. Fall out, called a single voice, at a walk. They fell out of march and slowed, still approaching. Lisette watched fascinated. She had seen photos, of course, even short video clips on the kingdom's Nornet feeds, but this was the first time she had seen one in person. And not one, but half a dozen. No, eight, ten. No, the last two were actual horses. They were an intimidating sight, and here she was at the edge of town with children in her charge, confronted with these creatures, soldiers and war horses combined. Well, all she could do would be to yell, run, and lead the children into the woods, not that that would help much. Meantime, it seemed sensible to treat the event as a surprise parade, as the children were doing. These were the king's own troops, after all. As the dust settled, one approached, closely followed by a second. He wore a tan military jacket and a wide-brimmed hat. He carried a pack on his back, his human back, and four more behind his equine shoulders. His face was quite human, white-bearded, red with heat, with bright blue eyes. His equine body was a dun, light tan with dark brown legs and tail, and a few traces of brown lingered in his beard. When he set foot in the schoolyard, the voice of the schoolhouse brownie shrilled, Return and we return! He looked toward the sound, coming from somewhere in the schoolhouse thatch, and doffed his hat, answering, Keep faith and so do we. His troop followed his gaze and raised their hats. The leader then doffed his hat again, this time to Lisette, and bowed, stretching out one foreleg as she had seen performing horses do. Good day, mademoiselle. We apologize for interrupting your class. His was the voice that had called the orders. His chenelets leaned toward the English side. They must come from that base in Berkshire. What was it called? A beat after his bow, his attendant, his lieutenant, she saw from the insignia, also uncovered and bowed. He was a tall palomino with blonde hair and beard, long waxed mustaches drooping in the heat. Behind the two of them, and another beat later, the rest of the company raised hats and bowed. If they had not been a little out of synchronization, it would have been comic or eerie. Six young men, well, they were compounded of young men, all bearded, all in the same gear as their captain and laden like him, a great black draft standing next to a much slighter chestnut, a palomino fanning his beautiful face with his hat and gazing wistfully at the children, a paint with a foxy smile, a big bay and a slightly smaller buckskin standing quiet and sober. At the back stood the two actual horses, a bay and a gray, bearing packs and wearing hats like the soldiers. The young chestnut held their leads. It pleased her that she remembered the names for the coat patterns. She had seen too little of anything equine for too long. She had not even ridden since last summer. 
While she took all this in, the elder had completed his bow and was saying something about not wanting to impose. Cenarian, Captain, she replied, happy at spotting his rank. It is the last day of school, and you have provided the children with something much more educational than an outdoor geography lesson. You are very kind. With your permission, might my lads use your well? He nodded toward it. Certainement. The water is quite good. Gerard, Andrea, assist the gentleman. That's unnecessary, mademoiselle, the captain began, but it was clear that it would take industrial machinery to get Gerard and Andrea away from that well. The other children flocked after. The soldiers unbound some of the packs from themselves and the horses, then approached, making the schoolyard much more crowded. While the children raised and lowered the bucket and passed around the iron cups, the captain made introductions. Captain Philip Fletcher of the Royal Dedicated Cavalry, in your debt, mademoiselle, and this is my lieutenant, Liam Sanders. Lisette Lecaisse, are you taking ship? She nodded down the road, not meaning Mer sur Isse, which had only fishing boats and other light craft, but Cote d'Is, further down the coast, silhouetted against the rainbow mists of the sea march at the edge. C'est vrai. My lads must get their sea legs, which of course is twice as hard for us. She laughed in return to his grin, but the remark was also useful. He had told her, we don't mind talking about what we look like, what we are. He went on to tell her that in Cote d'Is they would join the units of the infantry and standard cavalry to take the sea passage to Yasad Khonsu, where their journey would really begin. The lads were first-timers, trainees. He had led such groups many times before, but not recently past Mercer East. She told him she had been teacher here for only four years, and wondered if her predecessor had ever met the captain. She saw that behind Fletcher's back, the bay had nudged the buckskin with his hip. This would have staggered a man, but merely attracted the buckskin's notice, handed him a couple of iron mugs, and nodded at the two officers. The buckskin paced over and handed the cups silently to his superiors, who thanked him. Lucette thought it probably spoke well of Captain Fletcher that he had his men drink first and that they spontaneously waited on him. Meanwhile, Lucette took her tally of her own subordinates. Hubert, Jeanette, stop bothering that poor fellow. The huge black draft was standing statue still, a nervous smile on his face while two children raced in and around his legs. Only his head moved as he tried to track his invaders. The children barely had to duck as they ran under him. Perhaps in obedience to her command, Hubert and Jeanette raced away to some other devilment. The draft relaxed. He smiled at Lisette and saluted. Poor fellow, she said to the captain. He must feel he walks through a world of tissue paper. Fletcher had watched the interaction with a smile. He enjoys every moment of it. The transformation was very kind to him. A few months ago, he was thin as a rail and dying, gasping for every breath. I am surprised the deathly ill do not flock to the dedicated cavalry in hordes. Usually it would not help. The healers could do nothing for him themselves, but scried that he had a rare case the transformation would cure. Such unfortunates more often join the phase if they can. So you're not phase? asked Suzanne, the eldest girl. She had been standing silently at Lisette's side watching. You're not magical? We are mortal, Fletcher affirmed. We were made from men. Each of us used to be a little boy like this one. He nodded down to where Hubert had paused in his latest orbit to stare at the captain. He stayed, apparently mesmerized by the equation Fletcher had just made. When we grew up, we went to the dedicated cavalry and asked to join and so be transformed. We were changed by magic, but we have no more magic than we went in with. Are you answered? Yes, thank you, said Suzanne. Do you take girls? The spell was copied from some magic arrows we found. It only works on males. We haven't found one that works on females. Oh, arrows? We are changed by being shot. Oh, does it hurt? Fletcher shook his head. It is very confusing, but it doesn't hurt. Lisette surveyed the soldiers. I have wondered how people come to choose transformation. Do you know the story for each of your men? Yes, some are simple, some not. Some of the lads are open about their reasons, others private. Myself, I'm simple and open. I follow the hoof prints of an uncle I loved who enjoyed this life greatly. She continued gazing, trying to guess what each soldier had looked like as a man. 
If the draft had changed so much, how could one guess? And what would they be like? What would they each be doing if they had not chosen this change? Dying or rotting in one case, of course, their very bodies were a puzzle. Hips were shoulders, necks were waists, beautiful horses, strong young men, comely monsters, unnatural but harmonious. Yes, transformations baffle that way, said Fletcher, apparently reading her gaze. What is, what was, what could be or could have been, all swirled around, like any birth or death or maturation, but faster and stranger. You are a philosopher, Captain. Scholars on hooves, Mademoiselle, that's us. Can I have a ride? It was Jeanette, suddenly at the captain's forefeet, staring up at what must have looked like a grandfather to her, and grandfathers were easy. And a grandfather who was a pony at the same time, not to be missed. Jeanette, she remonstrated, the poor fellows are tired. Yes, you may have a ride, the captain interrupted. He scooped Jeanette up and dropped her down on his lieutenant's back. The lieutenant reciprocated by seizing Hubert, who was of course underfoot, and depositing him on his captain's back. Behind them, the soldiers grinned and chuckled. She caught the phrase, like he said. It seemed this was some inside joke. This march is an endurance exercise, mademoiselle, the captain told her. We were hot and thirsty, no longer, thank you, but we have no business being tired. All the soldiers were kneeling now, and small children were scrambling onto their backs in twos and threes. She heard repeated instructions to hold onto the straps on the backpacks. Then they all paced clockwise round the schoolhouse, a living merry-go-round. Only once around, then everyone off, wise restraint. Then the big draft invited the older children on. Giggling and gingerly, they accepted as he and all the others, including the captain and lieutenant, knelt again. Hubert marched behind the big draft, lifting his knees exaggeratedly, clearly pretending to be one of these magnificent soldier horses. She worried for a moment that he might get kicked by accident, but the draft moved to the side a little, then fell back, and soon had Hubert marching beside him rather than behind. Jean was riding the paint with a sideways smile. Jean was next oldest after Suzanne and physically ahead. A tiny worry skittered through Lisette's mind again. What if he simply took off with her? The answer came immediately. His fellows would run him down and trample him to paste. Anyway, the paint bore an expression of wry patience, no more. Fletcher came round, unloaded two boys, then gestured down his flank and said, Mademoiselle, the carousel is still open. Oh, she felt herself blush. I'm not dressed for, there is a decent horn on the saddle. You could hook one knee over it and ride side saddle. Have you done that before? Bien sûr, and she climbed on. It was the easiest mounting of a horse uh, and equine she had ever done since he knelt for her. When was the last time she had had a chance to ride a horse, much less a ride like this? She was of one mind with Jeanette, not to be missed. Considered as a ride, it had its drawbacks. Fletcher apologized for having no stirrups. The saddles, she learned, were there for his lads to practice with. No one had expected actual riders. Fletcher had taken off a couple of packs, but two remained and got in the way. And decent horn or not, a standard saddle is not a side saddle. But he made it almost embarrassingly easy, pacing smoothly around with children following, cheering and chattering. He smelled of a mixture of man sweat and horse sweat, not badly, and it reminded her of the last ride with Jules long, last summer, too long ago. This was sure to get back to Jules, but that was a good thing, she decided. It could start an interesting conversation. Rank hath its privileges, the captain murmured under the noise of the children. If anyone gets to carry the one grown woman here, it's going to be me. She laughed and felt the blush again. This was the second or third time he had echoed her thoughts, and she wondered if he were receptant. Don't say the name, he continued. What name? Nessus. I wasn't even thinking it. She felt a single kick of laughter run through the rib cage under her. Mademoiselle, not to say it is discreet, not to think it is insulting. She laughed again. If it helps, I was thinking something of the sort when your fellows were giving rides to the older girls. Yes, we have a reputation to repair, even after 3,000 years. You are doing very nicely. 
and she considered that Fletcher was also taking care of her reputation. If she had ridden that golden horse god, for instance, the conversation with Jules might have become too interesting. Once around the schoolhouse, the, then he knelt and she dismounted, thanking him. She made him and his troops take another round of water and refill their canteens. She inquired after the actual horses and learned the young chestnut had watered them already. She and the children helped them strap packs back on. Then they bade them goodbye with genuine regret and watched them march away. O'er the hills will march today, the king has called, so we obey. We stand our ground and here we'll stay, over the hills and far away. Hubert marched in place as he watched, clearly entranced. Lisette considered his white blonde hair. Perhaps he would make a handsome Palomino someday. And when I wrote this, I thought this was going to be the last of the cavalry stories, but it's not. <laughs>